Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson case. Five years ago, in a Los Angeles court, former American football star and actor O.J. Simpson stood accused of murdering his ex-wife Nicole and waiter Ron Goldman in a bloody knife attack. Action find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. The verdict divided America and the world. In the eyes of many, despite his repeated protestations of innocence, he was and remains a guilty man. But the world has not been told the full story. Tonight, this film reveals that the evidence heard in court was only part of the real picture. It also reveals that clues which pointed away from Simpson as the killer were dismissed or ignored. It shows that crucial evidence was tampered with and destroyed that the police so contaminated the crime scene that the evidence was unsafe. And it reveals that there is a potential suspect, a close member of Simpson's family who has never been questioned. And that six months before her murder, someone was offered money to kill Nicole. This is OJ, the untold story. <laughs> At around 10.30 p.m. on the night of the 12th of June, 1994, O.J. Simpson was a man without an alibi. Was he chipping golf balls in his backyard, as he claimed? Or was he driving to Nicole's house in a white Ford Bronco to commit a grisly double murder? At 875 South Bundy Drive, in the comfortable suburbs of West Los Angeles, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman lay murdered with multiple stab wounds. They were discovered shortly after midnight. When I looked at the bodies, this to me was a rage killing. There were numerous apparent slash wounds, stab wounds. They appeared to be all over the bodies. Uh, one of the victims had what we call a bled out, if you will. Uh, the wounds were so severe, uh, and that was Nicole Brown. She was lying on a, on a walkway that angled down towards the street, and the blood was flowing in that direction. This is a crime of passion, overkill, jealousy, domestic, something of that nature. Rage, yes, absolutely. I mean, this alone shows you, bang, 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 bang. Those murders were ghastly. They were awful murders. I mean, Nicole Simpson had a slash of her throat that went all the way down into the vertebral column, three millimeters into the vertebral column. The detectives that arrived at Nicole's house on Bundy Drive in the early hours of the morning faced a forensic jigsaw puzzle. There was a left-handed leather glove covered in blood, bloody footprints, and five drops of blood heading away from the scene to the rear of the property. Here it's pretty obvious what happened. There was a struggle. The left glove came off during the struggle. The left hand or the left side of this perpetrator's body was injured. And as that person moved away, they bled. There was also an envelope containing a pair of glasses, which they later found Ron Goldman had come to deliver to Nicole. Thirty-five-year-old Nicole had been divorced from O.J. Simpson for two years. With two children together, Sydney and Justin, they had been fated as the perfect mixed-race couple but their relationship had broken down, despite numerous reconciliations. And since her divorce, Nicole had begun to live life in the fast lane. I think within the last year plus of her life, I think she blew a fuse. 
I mean, something happened. And I guess, you know, the drugs would do that, you know. Here she is one moment, a faithful wife, um, dedicated, you know, loving. And the next, like I said, the rumors you hear, she's doing coke or she's sleeping around. And and I, I, it was, it was the whole thing, man, it was, it was really, it was, it was very sad. On the evening of the murder, Nicole had gone to see her daughter Sydney dancing in a school show. Simpson was also there. He'd heard that day that his affair with girlfriend Paula Barbieri was over. After the show, Simpson went home while Nicole went on to a family dinner at the fashionable Mezzaluna restaurant where Ron Goldman worked as a waiter. Nicole was a frequent visitor. Since her divorce, she had become involved with various men from the restaurant. And six foot one, 25 year old Goldman was rumored to be a boyfriend. He had been to her house and been seen driving her Ferrari. Nicole and the children had returned home by 9.15. When detectives arrived, candles were alight. There was music playing and a bath was still warm. Rod Englert faced the task of trying to reconstruct what happened. Nobody will ever know what was in her mind when she walked out because she left her front door open, walked a few feet down the landing, down the steps where the attack occurred, and she was stabbed four times in the left side of the neck. The evidence suggests that Ron Goldman walked up and he is then attacked, and a struggle between the two, a confrontation between the two, occurs in her blood that's already bleeding. So she had to be down for her blood to bleed to the extent that it had already bled. But if Nicole went down quickly, the forensic evidence showed that Ron Goldman was involved in a violent struggle. He's struggling, he's fighting, he's twisting, he's turning, he's doing everything that he can to survive, and the other person is doing everything that he can to quieten him and kill him. And the best way to silence someone, one has to know that you sever the throat. And that's a kill. Tom Lang and three other detectives then went up to Simpson's house, a five-minute drive away on Rockingham Avenue. He had to be informed, but as the ex-husband, he was also a potential suspect. On their arrival, Detective Mark Furman told his colleagues that he'd found a speck of blood on the door of Simpson's white Ford Bronco, which was parked outside. The detectives then went on to the property and found that Simpson had left for Chicago a few hours before at 11 p.m. During their search at the house, Detective Furman said he found a right-handed glove covered in blood. Well, Furman had been to Bundy. Uh, it's, it's not too difficult to put two and two together. It's still four. He sees what appears to be a matching glove, and it's a right-handed glove. This now becomes a crime scene. As dawn broke, the police said they found spots of Simpson's blood on the drive of his house and in the entrance hall. Simpson was now the prime suspect. A few hours later, Detective Bert Looper supervised the search for more clues. In particular, the bedroom we, I wanted to see was the master bedroom, which was OJ's. And I have the photographer take several photographs before we even go in, one of which indicated some socks in front of the bed on the floor. At first, no one noticed that the socks were bloody, but later analysis showed otherwise. When those socks were examined with high-intensity light, there was a lot of blood because around the ankle of one of them was 19 projected spatters of blood all the way around and there were 39 on the other. That came back to Nicole Brown Simpson's blood and it was projected. That's the key. Those socks were present when they're fighting in that particular area. That's probably one of the strongest pieces of evidence in this whole case is that pair of socks. Simpson flew back from Chicago to face a house full of police and a story that was breaking all over the world. The detectives in charge of the case, Tom Lang and partner Phil Vanatta, immediately spotted what they thought was a vital clue. 
we not only wanted a statement from him and attempt to glean inconsistencies down the road, but his hand was bleeding. And guess which hand? His left hand. What can you say about this? Back up, please. Get out of the way. Well, we have a, a good shot at getting this evidence, and that hand is no evidence, because we know our killer is probably injured on the left side of their body, and guess what else we have? We have a left-handed glove at the crime scene, and he's got his left finger cut. We got the finger photographed. He cooperated. We also got his blood. And during the interview, you get these inconsistencies that we eventually got. He says he bled all over. But how? Well, first it's on the phone, he believes, and then it was in some other way. Uh, he, he cuts himself all the time. When did you park your Bronco on Rockingham where we found it? I think during a 32 or 33 minute interview, I got three different answers. Yeah, David, I told you before he wasn't going to say anything. I know you got to ask. While the detectives built their case, Simpson was released to face the media frenzy. I was convinced then that he is definitely a viable suspect, but I wasn't 100%. Phil was 100%. But I also knew, handling high profile cases in the past, that we better be damn sure. But as we went through the investigation, subsequent to the interview, Everything fell in line. There was nothing exculpatory. There was nothing that pointed in another direction. Everything pointed in one direction, and that was at Simpson. For the police, a key discovery was that Simpson had a history of abusive attacks on Nicole, both during their marriage and after they had divorced. There were also suggestions that Simpson had stalked her. The evidence seemed overwhelming. Four days after the murders, the police issued a warrant for Simpson's arrest, but he didn't surrender as promised. Mr. Simpson is a wanted murder suspect, two counts of murder, a terrible crime. We need to find him, we need to apprehend him, we need to bring him to justice as quickly as possible. Instead, with A.C. Cowlings at the wheel, Simpson had visited Nicole's grave, while another family friend and lawyer, Robert Kardashian, read a note that Simpson had left behind. I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I loved her and always will. I can't go on. No matter what the outcome, people will look and point. I can't take that. As the drama unfolded on live television, thousands came out onto the streets to watch the most wanted man in America go by. As the Bronco headed back to his house on Rockingham, Simpson held a gun to his head. A SWAT team was called and given their orders. Running after the Bronco was 24-year-old Jason, Simpson's son by his first marriage. Shortly after the police dragged Jason away from his father, Simpson gave himself up. In his own words, a depressed, lost man. In the months that followed, the police continued to build their case. They believed that Simpson had driven over to Bundy and had either stalked Nicole or been driven by Goldman's arrival into a fit of jealous rage. The detectives believed that he had then brutally murdered them both before driving back to his home, spreading blood in his Bronco as he went. The Bronco was a key crime scene in its own right. Rod Englert examined the vehicle when it was taken apart. When the detectives approached the white Bronco that was parked outside of the Rockingham Street address, there was a transfer of blood pattern on the Bronco door that was consistent with the bleeding left hand of O.J. Simpson. It's less than a half inch wide, a little over a quarter inch wide. Consistent with when he reaches up and touches that to open the door. And that pattern is also consistent with the pattern on the inside of the door well where you open the door to get out. The forensic team found Simpson's blood by the driver's door, on the driver's side carpet, on the seats, the instrument panel, 
and on the steering wheel. But it was the discovery of Nicole Brown's and Ron Goldman's blood, particularly on the centre console, that clinched it. For Englert and the team, it appeared to prove that Simpson had been involved in the crime. If there is any doubt in anybody's mind about this person not committing this crime, I mean, then they have a real problem with reality. I need something to point in another direction. I need something substantive that says someone else did or could have done this crime. None of that exists. Absolutely none of that. For the police, a mountain of evidence showed that Simpson was the murderer. But is their case really so conclusive? Not only is there significant evidence pointing away from Simpson, but it's also now clear from the new research for this film that there is evidence that the police dismissed or ignored. One private detective has followed it up, and what he has discovered puts the crime in a completely new light. Dallas, Texas. Over the last 40 years, Private Eye Bill Deere has solved a number of major cases and has a reputation for taking nothing for granted. Right from the start, he had major reservations about the police handling of the case, and so began his own investigation. They saw the bloody glove behind the bungalow at OJ's, and they put two and two together. And with a little bit of blood found in the Bronco and a little bit of blood that was found on the driveway, I think they made up their mind very quickly that it was OJ. And from that point on, they went no further. They had their man. I felt that in my mind, maybe, just maybe, there's something wrong here. Maybe we're not being told the story. Bill talked the case over with colleague Chris Stewart. I can't believe that a guilty man is going to voluntarily go down in the police car, followed by Harold Weissman, his lawyer, and say to the lawyer, lawyer, I don't need you. Just go ahead and sit outside. Go have a cup of coffee. I'll talk to him. If I just killed two people, why would somebody like O.J. allow himself to be cross-examined, ask questions, photographed, fingerprinted, everything that they did to him if he was guilty? The case is too comfortable. That's the problem I've got with it. It's too pat. And I told Chris, I said, you know, I've got to know the truth. Bill Deere then went out to Los Angeles to examine the crime scene for himself. This is uh, where her black Jeep was found. The back gate's been changed, the number's been changed, but other than that, this is the way it was when I arrived about three weeks after the murders. And uh, that night I came back, posted Chris across the street in the car to watch out and watch for my back, and uh, hiked myself up over the fence. I came down the steps, walked the narrow passageway, up steps, down steps, and there I'm standing there by her door. And uh, I'm looking now, and I still see some blood there. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking at what I've been told by the press, that he was hiding behind the bushes. And I'm saying, he can't be hiding behind the bushes. There's a brick wall there separating one neighbor to the other. There had to be a lot of commotion and a lot of screaming because these people were fighting for their life. Ron Goldman was a young man fighting for his life. The coal was young, didn't want to die. Upstairs, you had two minor children. I think that's one of the things that really bothered me all along. I'm a father. I'm a single parent. I could no more picture myself coming here, killing some, either my ex-wife or whatever, and leaving my two minor children to walk out and see the mother, the coal lying there with her head nearly decapitated and Ron Goldman laying against the fence bleeding all over the place with his eyes wide open. Nobody as a parent could do that. Another thing that was funny and the people that we talked to, they all said to me, did you know that OJ, it bothers him, the sight of blood? A weapon such as a knife is a weapon of choice. OJ could have done anything other than used a knife if he was afraid of blood. If you're going to use a knife, you're going to be cutting somebody. You're certainly going to see blood. They arrested O.J. right after he came back from the trip. To me, when they examined him, there should have been some bruises on him that were indicative of a fight. 
To Bill Deere, it was impossible for the killer to have come out of such a fight with nothing but a cut on his hand. And what's more, Ron Goldman was no average opponent. He was trained in karate. I think that's the one thing that really caught me off guard. How do you fight with Ron Goldman, a karate expert to some degree, who's got 20-some-odd stab wounds, who's fighting for his life, he's got bruised knuckles, there's marks on the bottom of Goldman's tennis shoes. There's a mark across the canvas top of it where he's trying to kick out, trying to defend himself in the karate motions in the defensive posture that he's been taught. Charles, you've had a chance to look at the crime scene pictures as much as we could really give you. Medic and trained karate expert Charles England has studied the Goldman fight. Bill wants Charles to show him how he thinks the fight occurred. Come on in, Jason. Let's I'm going to demonstrate what's happening in the fight scene. Ron Goldman comes by here. He's surprised by a strike. He's blocking. He's coming in. The assailant's right here. He's defending himself. He's striking. The assailant's coming down, trying to overbear on him. He's coming in. I'm stabbing. He leans back to the sidekick. Boom. He gets struck. He comes back in. One, two. He struck in. And three. Would there be any wounds or any marks on your body based on what Goldman has just done to defend himself and protect his life. If there were bruise marks on the knuckles, what would that be indicative of to you as a professional? He struck him. He struck, struck him, him multiple times. Stick your hands up to strike him. I would say there would be strike wounds in here and to the facial area. Reading the autopsy report, he had bruises around these two knuckles and somewhat the third, meaning he sunk his fist into the man. Could I have done this fight without any bruises whatsoever on my body? What would be the least I could walk away from? The least you could walk away from um, would maybe be a black eye, some bruised ribs, maybe even broken ribs. But when Simpson was examined shortly after the murders, no injuries or bruises were found, except for three small cuts on his left hand. Simpson has given various answers about the cuts, from a broken glass in his hotel room in Chicago to wrestling with his son. Forensic pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz viewed the photographs and testified in court against Simpson. These were not glass cuts. And uh, what they were were fingernail marks. How did they happen? He held her with his arm around her neck she, with her long acrylic fingernails, tried to get his arm off, inflicting those wounds, which by location on the fingers corresponded to that kind of a grasp. But even if they were fingernail marks, Goldman or Nicole couldn't have caused them. Goldman's nails were too short. And though analysis of Nicole's acrylic nails did show blood, it wasn't Simpson's. It pointed to someone else with a different blood group, blood group type B. So Simpson wasn't bruised as expected, and the fingernail evidence pointed away from him. There were more contradictions too. The police and the prosecution were adamant that Simpson had carried out the murder in a spontaneous fit of jealous rage. And yet they also believed that Simpson wore the gloves that had been found, suggesting a premeditated attack. But even this wasn't the most disturbing aspect of the police case. There were serious questions about the reliability of the evidence against Simpson at the crime scenes. One of the world's most respected forensic analysts is Dr. Henry Lee. Acting for the defense, he examined the scenes at first hand. There are certain principle, crime scene principle, basic procedure violated. Everybody together step all over the place and step into the blood. That's why the problem star, the contamination of the scene. The crucial issue in the case is walk all over the blood. Now you regenerate, redistribute all this pattern so the DNA grouping could be erroneous. Shoe print pattern in that little area becomes so complicated so many different patterns there, you really cannot tell which one from whom now. Peter Harper is a British specialist in this field and has reviewed the police handling of the scenes. 
he's astonished by the disregard of basic procedure. There's about seven to nine officers milling up and down that path, and it still hasn't been forensically examined or cleared. I mean, it's atrocious, that. It should never, ever have been allowed to happen. Now, there's a, the view here of the coroner's officer. He's now at the top of the steps, so he's walked through the blood, over the body. He's standing on the top step of the passageway, which again could either be the route of the murderer coming in or going out. And he's leaning up against railings. He's got his foot against the wall. He's rubbing valuable evidence away and again introducing evidence to that scene. The catalogue of errors goes on. According to Henry Lee, blood that had quite clearly dripped onto Nicole's back could very well have been the killer's. It was never even collected. This on her back, this passive dripping, clearly indicate could be another individual's blood. Could be Ron Goldman's, could be the suspect's. That's why it's so crucial for solving case to reconstruct the case. That seven drop of blood should collect. However, the moment you turn the body around, that seven drop is gone. The moment you put the body in the body bag, that seven drop were lost forever. Peter Harper and colleague Terry Merston found yet more violations of procedure. Ideally, you should have separate teams for each incident, and none of those teams should come into contact with one another so that if you have a potential murder scene at Rockingham, it must be kept completely separate from Bundy Drive. And equally so, the vehicle that was involved, that should also be treated as a separate scene. And it clearly hasn't been done, so you've cross-contaminated all three scenes. There are also major concerns about the blood evidence in the Bronco being contaminated. Incredibly, a number of officers who had been at the Bundy crime scene were reported to have been inside the Bronco before it had been examined. And one of those officers had looked after Nicole's dog, whose blood-stained paws had originally led people to the victims. The fact that he got into the vehicle has been proved that he visited the scene. He's contaminated that vehicle. Therefore, all that evidence, it isn't evidence. It's corrupt evidence. It's, 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 there is no validity to that evidence. If you went to the Crown Prosecution Services with that type of evidence, it wouldn't see the light of day. It certainly wouldn't go to court and it certainly wouldn't see a prosecution. Remarkably, just 36 hours after the murders, the Bundy Drive crime scene was washed down. But was this a case of bad police practice? Or was the evidence actively tampered with or even planted to help their case against Simpson. There were two pieces of crucial and damning evidence against him. Nicole's blood was found spattered on a pair of Simpson's socks in his bedroom, and blood was found on the back gate at Nicole's house three weeks after the scene had been washed down, which provided the best match by far to Simpson's DNA at the murder scene. But during the criminal trial, the defense requested that second tests be done on the blood from the socks and the gate. This time, they both revealed traces of a preservative called EDTA. EDTA is used by forensic scientists to stop blood clotting in the test tube. It cannot occur naturally in blood. The sock test showed that EDTA was found only in the blood stains and not in the rest of the socks. And the gate test had the same results. EDTA was found only in the blood stains and not in the control samples taken from the gate. For Terry Merston and Peter Harper, there is only one interpretation. There cannot be any other explanation with EDTA in the blood that it's been put there. Because it doesn't occur naturally. It's just specifically in the spots of blood and not on the socks. Say for argument's sake that you could get EDTA in, in soap powder or something like that. Well, if, if that was possible, then that would explain the EDTA in the blood because it was in the socks. But when the socks haven't got EDTA or any sign of it, but the blood has, it speaks for itself.
Someone must have put it there. The blood evidence in Simpson's Bronco was also crucial to the case against him. Two days after the murders, the car was tested. Simpson's blood was found, but there were also traces of both victims' blood. Particularly noticeable were the bloodstains on the centre console, labelled as items 30 and 31. Item 30 was found to be only Simpson's blood. But like the sample from the gate, when the blood evidence in the Bronco was re-examined three months later, it had also changed. In particular, the results from the console were now very different. Item 30, re-labelled as 303 and 306, was now found to be a mixture of Simpson's, Ron Goldman's and Nicole's blood. 304 and 305 also differed from the original analysis. And 305 could only have been made with a hand wet with fresh blood. So how did the stains get there? If they were made by either of Simpson's hands, then the hands had to be covered in blood from both himself and the victims. But if that's the case, then everything else he touched, like the door handle, steering wheel or light switch, should also be smeared with the same mixture. But these smears are all just Simpson's blood alone. If the stains were made with Simpson's right hand and he was still wearing the glove, then the finger area of the glove should have his blood on the fingertips as well as blood from the victims. However, Simpson's blood is not found on the fingertips at all, nor is that mixture of all three of them found anywhere else in the vehicle. We both think that that blood, those finger marks, were put on that console at a later time. They were not on that console at the time of the murder. The area they're in, I would say, is impossible for those finger marks to be put onto that console without either the console being removed or the seat being removed. And the reason I say that is because the finger marks, if they were facing downwards, you might say, OK, that's a possibility, but they're not. The finger marks are facing upwards. You can't do it with the, with the right hand unless you've got an extremely flexible wrist and you can turn your hand at right angles. It's got to be your left hand, which means the elbow and forearm have got to be below the hand. They wouldn't be able to do it because they wouldn't get their elbow and forearm low enough for their hand to put the finger marks in that position. So with serious doubts over the blood from the Bronco, the gate and the socks, does this mean that the police were actively sweetening the case against Simpson? Numerous allegations have now surfaced about LAPD officers planting evidence. Detective Mark Furman, the racist officer who discovered some of the most important clues, was involved in cases where suspects were beaten and reports were falsified. Questioned under oath, he pleaded the Fifth Amendment, the only way in an American court to avoid giving an answer. Detective Furman, uh, have you ever falsified a police report? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. And there were other disturbing aspects to the police evidence. Simpson's defense team also alleged that some of the blood taken by the police after his interview had gone missing. And they discovered that all the main blood samples were taken away by one detective. We learned in the criminal trial that a lead detective had a vial of Mr. Simpson's blood. That alone, in any other case less controversial than this, would have been enough to have, have the case. Would, if that had been discovered as it was here, then the case would be over, literally. But we learned in the civil case, which went against Mr. Simpson, nevertheless we learned that that same senior detective had gone to the coroners and asked for and received samples of the victim's blood. And therefore, the blood of all the principles, that's 100% of the blood types found in this case, on the fence, on the ground, on gloves, on socks, on clothing, in the car, the universe of blood in this case, samples of which were in the hands of senior, at least one senior detective, thus violating the chain of evidence, absolutely, violating every safeguard, every tradition, every expectation on the part of the prisoner at the bar, 
not admitted freely, but dug out by a highly active and aggressive defense team. Mr. Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? So despite Simpson's blood at the scene and his lack of an alibi, there are now reasonable doubts about the evidence at all three crime scenes. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of when the, the verdict came, America stopped to watch, and the result split the nation. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder and violation of Some hailed the result as a victory over a system that would do anything to secure a conviction. His defense team believed that there was a wider pattern of police corruption. Whatever evidence may have been manipulated, a year later Simpson faced another trial, this time in the civil courts. In this case, brought by the victim's families, dramatic new evidence emerged. The main set of bloody footprints by the bodies and down the path to the rear was made by a style of Bruno Magli shoes, of which there were only 300 pairs sold in the United States. Under oath, Simpson denied owning a pair. A photographer in Buffalo, New York, where Simpson played football for the better part of his career, uh, heard about his testimony regarding the shoes and started rummaging through photographs that he had of O.J. Simpson. And sure enough, he has this picture of Simpson wearing what appear to be these Bruno Mogli shoes. And what was remarkable about the photograph is that you could actually see the sole Simpson was r reported in the uh, article as saying it was a complete fraud, it was laughable, somebody doctored the picture with digital equipment and that is not the shoes that, that he wore that day. Right before the end of the trial, another photographer in Buffalo came forward with 30 more photographs of Simpson wearing the same shoes on the same day and to top it off, a photo included in that group of 30 of him wearing the shoes was published in a newspaper put out by the Buffalo Bills organization nine months before the murders. So now we had the photo in a newspaper, a matter of public record, meaning it was impossible for anybody to have doctored these photos. Simpson lost the case and was ordered to pay the families of the victims millions of dollars. The family's lawyers had successfully argued to the civil trial jury that Simpson owned a pair of Bruno Magli shoes. So could Simpson have been at the crime scene with or after someone else? Dr. Henry Lee believes he has found evidence that supports the idea of two people at the murder scene. At the scene, we notice another set of the shoe print, also on the Bundy walkway. With parallel line design, it's a smaller size, about ten and a half. It's not one, it's quite a few. Which indicative that's a trail. It's not a random deposit. Dr. Lee was told that none of the shoe prints from the police officers or other officials at the scene matched this parallel line design. It could be a second person, another suspect. That's a possibility. Could be a witness, another possibility. Simpson's defense team also unearthed a third possible shoe print, this time leaving the scene heading on to Bundy Drive. So is there an explanation that makes sense of all this evidence that points away from Simpson as the killer and yet explains the footprints and the blood at the scene? Private eye Bill Deere thinks he has some answers and tonight reveals his findings. From watching the trial, there's no doubt in my mind he came to the crime scene. But to me, he came after the murders. Deere wondered whether anyone else could have caused Simpson to go to the scene. After investigating other possible suspects, he honed in on just one, Simpson's son from his first marriage, Jason. Then I picked up the phone and called my source and I said, find out if there's any record at the police department of Jason Lamar Simpson ever being interviewed by the police department. He said, no, they never interviewed him. 
I said, what? Are you really telling me they never interviewed him? Never interviewed him. So I said, okay, I've got to look further. I go down to the city and I look up criminal records. I found that the day of the murders, that Jason Lamar Simpson was on probation. Deer discovered that Jason, a chef, had been put on probation for a violent attack on an employer, Paul Goldberg. He also found that Jason had other convictions, including drunken driving and hit and run. I talked to Ms. Goldberg. <laughs> Great. <laughs> What'd you find out? Deer and colleague Herman King tracked down Mrs. Goldberg, who witnessed the attack. But she said he worked for us about three or four months, and uh, one day he called in and said, I can't come in, I'm sick. And then two of the other cooks came in and said, hey, I saw Jason at a basketball game. Next day, Jason shows up and said, um, I, uh, I'm back to work now. Uh, I think I'm going to quit, and I want to be paid for being off, for being sick. And Paul said, no, I'm not going to pay you for being off. You were at a basketball game. He said, you're going to pay me. And said his face started lighting up. He said, you're going to pay me. You owe me. And Paul said, no, I'm not going to pay you, and turned to what? walk away. What? And said, all of a sudden, Jason came run up behind him and hit him from the back and was hitting him from the back. And when he fell down, Jason was stomped him with his foot. Ah. Next thing you know, he reached for a knife, hmm. one of the uh, kitchen knives or chef knives. Right. And she said the police were called and said uh, Jason was arrested and um, the charges were filed. When they went to court, she said that the charges were lowered to a misdemeanor, but he was uh, fined and placed on probation. After many interviews with people who knew Jason, Deere discovered that he had a troubled past and a history of violence. Aged 15, Jason had even attacked a statue of his father with a baseball bat. For Deere, the key question now was whether Jason had a confirmed and convincing alibi. On the night of the murders, 24-year-old Jason was working as a chef at Jackson's restaurant in Beverly Hills. He was known by the people that worked there, and pretty well liked, too, if I remember right. And um, as, like most chefs, he had his own utensils, his knives, and as I remember, they were all accounted for. According to the police, Jason had a watertight alibi. He was cooking until late that evening. We've established that he was with people that spoke for him, that they were with him, and uh, his times were accounted for. So he was eliminated as a suspect very quickly. Well, I've always taken a position, you never assume, you always verify. So I went to the restaurant. I then am talking to the waitresses, and I said, I was in on the 5th, I think it was the Sunday before, and I named the date because it was June 12th when, when the Colden were murdered. And I said, you had hardly anybody here. She said, yeah, we were lucky we had 20, 25 people. We started closing right after uh, July on Sunday, lack of business. Well, all of a sudden, my mind's clicking. And I knew then that, hey, something wrong. So how early did the restaurant shut that night? Deer tracked down a former waiter at Jackson's to find out. What time do you think they would have shut down if there was no business on June 12th? There would be no business like on Sunday. Even now we're a little busy, like 9.30 kitchen starts breaking down. If on Sunday night, June 12th, there was only 20 to 25 people, then you'd shut down, what, 8.30, 9? 9. You'd leave early. So if the restaurant shut as early as 9, who could give Jason his alibi? Jason himself has given an account of his movements on the night of the murders. He stated that his girlfriend, Jennifer Green, picked him up in his car around 10 to 10.30 and they drove to her apartment. He then dropped her off and went home, where he watched television until 3 in the morning. To verify Jason's story, his girlfriend's testimony would be crucial. Deer tracked her down to a fashion store in West Los Angeles. I located, finally, the girlfriend, Jennifer Green. I said, were you with him on the night of June 12th? Absolutely. She said, well, I was supposed to pick him up at 9.30, so I got there right at 9.30. And he came out, and he said, I'll be a few minutes. He came out a little before quarter till 10. I said, what happened then? She said, well, he came out, 
I said, was he carrying anything? Oh, yeah, he carries his knives that he takes with him. I said, oh, you're talking about his chef's knives? She said, yes, his chef's knives. And he got into the Jeep, and we drove to my house. We got out and went upstairs to my apartment. I said, to what time? Oh, Mr. Dear, he was with me till after 11 o'clock. The two stories were in direct contradiction to each other. The times were different, and Jason stated that he never went up to her apartment, but Jennifer was adamant. She said, you can verify it from the time clock. You know, his time records will show what time we left. We left about 9.45. It was about a five-minute drive from Jackson's restaurant to Jennifer's apartment, and a further 15 to 17 minutes to drive to Nicole's house on Bundy Drive. So Jason could have been at the crime scene at around 10.15 that night, which was the earliest the police believed the murders could have occurred. With doubts over Jason's alibi, Bill Deere continued to look into Jason's past, and in particular for a previous girlfriend, Dee Dee. What she said astonished him. It took me a couple years, but I found Dee Dee, and this is what Dee Dee told me. I dated him for quite a period of time. I liked him. But he had a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality. In fact, he tried to kill me. I went home one night, and Jason was mad. I had picked up Chinese food. He threw it at me. And I ran for my life, and he jumped on me, and he had in his hand one of his chef's knives. He took and pinned me there and reached down, and I thought he was going to kill me. But instead, he took the knife, and he cut off all my hair. I turn left here. Dear and colleague Herman King found that Jason had a history of disturbed behavior, which began as early as 14 when he overdosed on cocaine. This is where it gets a little hairy. Right. They discovered that Jason had been a heavy drinker as well as using other drugs also found that he'd been placed in a mental institution for evaluation and that he'd attempted suicide three times. There's his jeep. There's his jeep. One of Deere's methods is to go through people's rubbish. After examining Jason's rubbish for some time, he discovered that Jason was consuming a lot of alcohol and that he was taking a medicine called Depakote. Depakote is usually prescribed for seizures and a condition called rage disorder and should never be taken with alcohol. And after further research, they found that just six months before the murders, Jason said that he was losing control. Deer then discovered that Jason suffered from a condition called intermittent rage disorder. And because the murders showed signs of being rage killings, Deer wanted to find out how someone with the condition would behave what it usually refers to is a person who has um, moments when they may tend to be very, very calm, and then for what they may consider good reason, they may move into a state of, of extreme rage and extreme kind of violence. Frequently, that diagnosis is associated with a seizure kind of disorder, and the medication that's usually used is one that, that tends to control seizure activity. Now, two months prior to the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, I know from a previous girlfriend that my suspect quit using his Depakote. And the girlfriend said, why are you not taking your Depakote anymore? And he said, the stuff is making me feel like shit. That what would you think then? If, in fact, he has seizure activity, then, uh, uh, then he may be uh, just a, a walking time bomb. Deer then found that around the same time as Jason stopped taking Depakote, he'd made another attack, this time on girlfriend Jennifer Green. Headlines, O.J.'s son tries to kill girlfriend. I couldn't believe what I was reading. There it was, a picture of Jason, a picture of Jennifer Green, and a story where she admitted to friends that she was in fear of her life and that he had drug her out of a car. And actually, Jason knocked her to the ground and was beating her. Dee Dee verified it. Dee Dee was there. He had his hands around her throat and was trying to choke her to death. 
Why didn't the police ever interview him? Because they were convinced that O.J. was guilty. I'm not. According to the police investigation, Jason had no motive. He was very quickly eliminated. He had alibis. Uh, we knew his whereabouts. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, we're still looking at the ability to do the crime or the motive, and, and those things had to fit, and he, he was just eliminated very quickly, actually. But Bill Deere disagrees. He feels that Jason did have a possible motive. On the night of June 12th, Nicole Simpson, Justin, Sidney, and her entire family were scheduled to arrive not at Mesalunas, but at Jackson's Restaurant at 8908 Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills, California, for a dinner that was being prepared by Jason Simpson, O.J.'s son. But she never showed up. I wondered how it felt for a young man because in it, the question was asked, had you ever cooked for them, for them before? No. You ever cooked for your dad before? No. Dad never come to your restaurants where you work? No. Jason had to have been embarrassed that night laying out preparations for 11 people to come to Jackson's restaurant and nobody showing up. God, that had to hurt. And there was more. Jason had also been accused of stalking. He had followed ex-girlfriend Dee Dee after they had broken up. And even when she tried to get away from him, after the time he cut off all her hair, she went to New York. And guess who followed her? Jason. Jason used his father's apartment, O.J.'s, there in New York, to stalk her. Nicole also had complained of a stalker. Before she was murdered, Nicole told former police officer and family friend Ron Shipp that she thought it might have been Jason. When she called me about the prowler, she said there was two people that, that she thought it could have been. She said, she says, you know, she says, I'm not sure who it was. She says, it was either O.J. or Jason. And I'm thinking, you know, here again, I'm thinking to myself, O.J. or Jason. Nicole had taken Jason out to various nightclubs. Could he have become infatuated with her? I mean, you got this this guy. She's taking him out dancing all the time, and they're having a great times. And and um, but uh, yes, yeah, that's always a possibility. And and like I said, I'll never forget that her saying that to me. You know that she thought it was O.J. or Jason. Jason declined to be interviewed for this film. Currently, the evidence that links him to the crime is circumstantial and there is no proof of his involvement. The police failed to examine the inconsistencies in Jason's story. But there was also another major line of inquiry that the authorities... Believing that Simpson was the sole suspect, they also dismissed the leads provided by Nicole and Simpson's other life, involving sex and drugs, which might have provided another motive for the murders. This case is in the, in the West End, or West L.A. or West Hollywood. Drug usage is like tea, it's like coffee. So the drug issue was there, no question about that. Uh, and, and the rage of the way the, the homicide took place could also lead a reasonable person to conclude that it's got to be somebody crazy to, uh, to do something like that. During the year before her death, Nicole and her friends were moving in drug-related circles. Metzaluna's restaurant was widely rumored to be a place to buy drugs, and Ron Goldman was alleged to sell them. What's more, just a year before the murders, Goldman's friend and nightclub owner Brett Cantor was killed in a similar savage knife attack. And other waiters working for the Metzaluna chain were murdered or went missing within 18 months. Simpson was also known to take cocaine. So could his or Nicole's involvement with drugs provide an explanation for the murders? Author Donald Freed believes it may shed light on Simpson's presence at the crime scene and his strange behavior. I think this is a drugs murder. I think Mr. Simpson knows basically who did it. I think his guilt is based not on what he did, but on what he did not do. I believe he feels he may have left his children as hostages to fortune. 
He says that he will never forgive himself for not having followed the advice of a friend of Miss Brown's who had said, get your ex-wife and your children out of here. There was something wrong. I think he hints broadly uh, at the context of the murder. What he does not say and what keeps him from ever clearing his name, perhaps, is that to really clear his name, he would have to speak of what he knew, and that involves drugs and all sorts of things that perhaps are more painful uh, almost than being wrongfully accused of murder. And from this murky world of drugs, there was a major lead which even the police wanted to investigate further. But the district attorney's office dismissed it as pure fabrication. Just five weeks after the murders, a story surfaced which showed that Nicole was being stalked by someone else. Police in Newport Beach, just south of Los Angeles, sent out a press release. It stated that they had convicted a man who had stolen the car of Simpson's then-girlfriend, Paula Barbieri. When they arrested the man, named Bill Waz, they also discovered that he had a notebook detailing surveillance on Nicole. So if Nicole was being stalked, could this be part of a conspiracy that led to her murder? Whoa, this is interesting. I mean, I can remember the, the thrill, the, the adrenaline was rushing through the entire press corps that day when all of a sudden it came out. Somebody was stalking Nicole Brown Simpson in December, and he's in jail with a diary, and one of the reasons he's in jail is for stealing Paula Barbieri's truck. Whoa, a lot of coincidences here, a lot of interest. CNN raced to get the news story. Why did they hire you to follow Nicole? They wanted to know who she was seeing, who she was meeting. Who hired you? Could you tell me? You don't want to tell me? I can't tell you yet. That's, that's pushing it. You know, I have my life too, you know. It's not much, but it's all I got. The Los Angeles police took Waz's story seriously too. They sent one of their most experienced murder detectives on the case to Calipatria Prison to check it out. We flew down there and went in and talked to Mr. Waz. My objective with Mr. Waz was twofold. One, obviously, to get a handwriting exemplar that would certainly uh, lock it down that he was, in fact, the one that wrote that, those entries, which he never denied. And the other was, is to find out what was going on. Bill Waz was also a cocaine dealer. He'd been introduced to Simpson and a close friend by one of the staff in the Roxbury nightclub. Uh, he hooked me up with some people that wanted to buy some, some cocaine, and uh, then OJ came strolling over, and he introduced himself as well. Still in prison, Waz agreed to be interviewed by telephone for this film. They weren't habitual users, they were recreational users, maybe twice a week. Waz said he delivered cocaine to Simpson and Nicole at the home on Rockingham Avenue. But more importantly, Waz also says he supplied Simpson's friend. It was this same friend who then asked him to follow Nicole and to take pictures of her with any man she met. No private eye, Bill Waz thought that it would be easy money. They asked me if I would uh, do a little surveillance on OJ's ex-wife, see if she was cheating on him with uh, any individual. But she was at that time staying at the Rockingham address. I picked her up there. I followed her around for about a day and a half. And uh, I took some pictures at Tony Roma's off Ventura Boulevard of her kissing a black individual, a man, who I later learned was uh, Marcus Allen. Nicole's affair with American football star Marcus Allen had already caused friction. Armed with the rolls of film, Waz met Simpson's friend, who can't be named for legal reasons, in the parking lot of McDonald's on Ventura Boulevard. I believe I turned over the, the film and got the cash to him at the parking lot in Encino, McDonald's. And ten days after that, he invited me over to his house. Remarkably, the friend then asked Waz to steal Simpson's girlfriend's four-wheel drive car. 
Waz was told when and where to take it, even where the keys would be. Shortly after stealing the car, Waz was arrested and jailed for 20 years for a series of armed robberies. But clearly, he knew more about the operation. After getting the basic details, Detective Bert Looper wanted to know who'd hired him. I asked him, well, you know, who are these people? Were they friends of O.J.? Or, you know, well, they're close to O.J. And then he starts asking me some questions. Waz asked Detective Looper how much he knew about this particular friend of Simpson's. Well, maybe you should look into his background. Uh, maybe you should be looking into his friends. Well, if you're listening to what he's telling you, then the connection back to O.J. is there. All right, so why would O.J. want to follow Nicole, and why would O.J.'s friend hire this dope-dealing drug addict uh, to do it? So with this information, I go back to the police department, and I said, look, Tom, this guy's righteous. He's telling me the truth. He admits to writing this stuff. We got the handwriting exemplar, and it solidifies that. This is way before the murder occurred. I think that this guy can lead us to uh, a contract killing, and we can go after more than one person here. And I don't remember if it was Phil or Tom who said, hey, they're not going to follow it up. Forget it. That's coming from the DA's office. That isn't coming from two investigators who know that this is a good clue or a good direction to follow. For the prosecution, Waz's story didn't fit with the notion of Simpson as the jealous husband and lone killer. Just two months after the murders and before the court case had even begun, the investigation was dropped. While we're all running around trying to get some answers to this, we're told by both sides. Ah, another one of those cranks. Guys, don't worry about it. That notebook was made up in prison. It's a forgery. It's a fake. Forget about it. Go on. So, and I'm ashamed to say I was one of the press, I was one of the people at the middle of the press corps at that time. And because we had so many things like coming, like coming and going like that, I'm embarrassed to say I believe them. Since both sides put it out so categorically, and it made sense. Another criminal trying to make money off of the O.J. Simpson case. But four years later, Joe Bosco discovered that the Waz notebook was not a forgery as he had been told. He then tracked Waz down to interview him. Still in prison, Waz told him the full story. Waz explained that ten days after handing over the photographs, he had been asked by Simpson's same friend to a meeting for a new assignment. It was ventilating rage and how, how much she caused O.J., how she, she talked too much about business ventures, but her sleeping with uh, a lot of his friends. It would be safe to say that she kind of uh, pushed the envelope a little bit there. So. But tonight, he also reveals that Simpson's friend then hired him as a hitman to kill Nicole. Basically made the proposition, asked him wanted me to uh, take a certain gun, which he had, which I did not take. Asked me if I would do her for, you know, get rid of her for 15 grand. And I semi accepted the responsibility of do the deed. But Waz suspected that if he killed Nicole, he would be set up as the fall guy. I believe that they'd have had me done the deed, either A, frame me for it, or B, kill me on the spot and place me as some kind of psycho stalker of OJ's women or something. Who knows? But I already saw that coming, sort of, so I that's why I never even intended to uh, do the deed. Bosco then approached Bill Hodgman, the director of special operations in the district attorney's office, who had worked on the case. And I said, Bill, you remember the Waz story? Is it worth following up on? Is it, is it worth my time? And Bill Hodgman said something I'll never forget. He said, Joseph, if they gave me a paid leave of absence, I would do nothing but work the Waz angle. I believe that's where this crime would have been and can be broken. Bosco then brought in a former senior prosecutor to act as Waz's lawyer, who needed to be convinced of his client's story. I wanted to really get inside of his mind. He's a very awesome, intimidating individual, and I wanted to look him in the eye, so to speak, and see what's in it for you. 
See, if there was something in it for him, then maybe I'd have had a different read on it. But when a guy gives you this kind of evidence, lays himself out, uh, is threatened. See, now he's going to be known as a snitch, right? Snitch is not what you want to be in Calipatria. And uh, he was on level four, which is with the bad of the baddest, okay? Uh, those were the highest killers in prison. That's where he was stationed. So you, want, you don't want to be laying yourself out unless you get something. And I, he, he wanted nothing. I said, well, what do you want to do this for? It was almost like, uh, I hate to say it, he was an honorable crook. Bill Hodgman, in the district attorney's office, was impressed by the evidence backing up Waz's story. He asked Bert Looper, the detective who had investigated the case first time round, to work with Bosco. They began to look into Simpson's friend. Looper and Bosco discovered that the friend had connections to other illegal activities. They found that Nicole may have become indiscreet about these criminal enterprises, and that she might have been killed to keep her quiet. But a new LAPD investigation of the Simpson case was not a popular move. It was shut down. When you get into embarrassing the department or hurting or tarnishing the image of the Los Angeles Police Department, as the O.J. Simpson did, case did do, it, it embarrassed the investigative branch of the Los Angeles Police Department. Bottom line. They don't want that again, all right? Because now they've got to deal with the same issues again. They just don't want to know. They don't want to know what really happened. I mean, that's the best way I can put it. I would have loved to have heard, you know, about Waz when it happened. I would have loved to have seen what was the reason why you guys don't want to follow his lead. Can't hurt you. In my view, that investigation should have proceeded onward. If you go after these people and you have a solid case and you're working with a solid foundation and you're, and you're doing the right things, who cares if you get embarrassed? I mean, you know, is your job the truth or is it your image? The district attorney's office refused to take part in this film. They closed down the Waz investigation twice despite evidence of a plot against Nicole. They failed to investigate Jason Simpson's alibi. They failed to compare Jason's fingerprints with the nine unidentified prints found at the murder scene. And in a last and final twist, they have also failed to follow up a forgotten clue from Ron Goldman's shirt, which one of the original trial consultants believes could shed light on the killer. There's two patterns that are very significant and quite remarkable on the back of his shirt. And those are grab patterns, bloody grab patterns, meaning that the hand of someone else, not himself, because it would be impossible, that have grabbed and twisted the back of his shirt in the mid-back and on the upper left shoulder. Using new scientific techniques, Rod Englert believes that these grab patterns could still identify the killer once and for all. In the last two years, there has been a process of getting fingerprints off of cloth with blood as the medium. And yes, this shirt has the possibility of now, even today, even though it's been handled, but I don't think it'll ever be done. This case is closed. Nobody wants to talk about this anymore. A lot of things have happened. There's a lot of water under the bridge, and the jury has already spoken. Five years on, is it possible that the case could be reopened? It's clear from the new leads revealed tonight that a new investigation may be able to solve the crime. With accusations of corruption within the Los Angeles police forcing the reopening of hundreds of other cases, the truth about the deaths of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman could still be told. O.J. Simpson was asked to discuss the issues raised in this program. He has declined to do so.